dialogue on paper, too. I continue the dialogue with the readers in their letters and Mr. Salah al-Din al sharnabi asks two questions, which I prove here with his words, and then I answer. He says, first, why, especially in developing countries, is there a deep gap between words and actions? Although these are countries that need progress and seriousness, why is the saying true of work in developed countries? Second, what is the standard that developing countries follow in dealing with the problems they face? It always leads them to a dead end and to temporary solutions. What is the standard in developed countries that leads them to solve all their problems seriously and decisively, which leads them to the tangible progress that we see in these countries? Regarding the first question, before answering, I would like to draw attention to the seriousness of the mistake that we often fall into whenever we generalize the statement in a way that is neither cautious nor conservative. Words and actions do not always differ by a deep gap in developing countries, nor do they always coincide in countries. Advanced. So many of our sayings, here in Egypt for example, example, and perhaps Egypt is what the questioner means. I say that very many of our sayings have been consistent with our actions in our major projects and in our smaller projects alike, so establishing industry heavy and light, I see it as in line with what we targeted at the beginning of the road. If there are stumbles in the course of action, I do not think that they are due to what may be called the gap between words and deeds and the expansion of education from its first levels to its highest levels. I also see it as being in line with what we hoped for. If we find a decline in the general level, this is not due to a gap between our words and action, as much as it is due to other material circumstances, such as a terrible increase in numbers in relation to our financial and human capabilities. We do not accept for ourselves to close the doors of education to those who desire it, nor do we we are able, at least financially, to face this huge number of pupils and students, a confrontation in which we maintain a high standard, and so on in many aspects of our lives. Likewise, if we direct our attention to the developed countries, I do not think that we will find that their actions always coincide with their words, otherwise we would not see the rule being circulated among the parties, where the right-wingers rule one time promising things that they do not fulfill, that after them the left-wingers take over the role, and in turn they promise actions that they are unable to accomplish, and so on, so forth. However, after this reservation, I must agree with the questioner that in developing countries, there are many discrepancies between words and deeds to a degree that we do not see in developed countries, and this phenomenon has two main causes. One of them may be a lack of good faith, which is often latent in the souls of workers, and the other the other has no basis for forgiveness. To explain this, we say, the so-called developing countries are the same countries that gained their freedom and independence recently. It happened in each country that a government of its own took over the rule, after the rule had previously been in the hands of usurping foreigners. What did the national rulers find? They found a people deprived of their rights, deprived of satisfying their necessary needs for education, health and work, and deprived of living on a reasonable economic level. It was necessary for these new rulers to quickly satisfy some of those needs as much as possible, but the least amount of that satisfaction would be enough to swallow up the largest part of production, so the officials saw themselves between two things, either they would continue to satisfy the needs of those who were deprived of it for many years, and the entire product would evaporate. In the blink of an eye, there is no surplus left in their hands to add to the development of production, or they restrict spending to meet the needs of the masses, who have been deprived for a long time thus indulging in the idea of social justice. In addition to being exposed to the discontent of these same masses, in other words, national governments soon find themselves capable either of sufficient production or of satisfying people's needs. Since both sides are required, regardless of the impossibility or even impossibility of achieving them, those national governments in developing countries are forced to promise what they do not achieve by promising people both sides, which is impossible. In the face of this paradox in the lives of developing countries after their independence, a slogan was raised calling for what they called the difficult equation. It was intended for the new national governments to try to seek a line that would realize the greatest possible hopes of the deprived peoples, because achieving all of them is impossible if we want to develop production, and at the same time, achieve the greatest possible productive development, because development to the due degree is impossible if we want to satisfy something of the needs of the 
deprived, but the slogan of the difficult equation is difficult, which forces officials to say, sometimes, what they do not do, not out of a lie, shortcoming or betrayal, but rather out of a necessity imposed on them by the nature of the situation they face, and that is what I said about it, a mistake that is forgivable due to the good intentions it entails. But there is another gap between words and actions in developing countries that cannot be forgiven, and that is that those to whom the reins of government fall after removing the external colonialist or removing the internal tyrant may be astonished by the authority that suddenly came to them with all the gains that follow, making them fearful that the sudden pride is destined for a sudden disappearance as well, and I am talking here about a common situation in developing countries, so they try to collect as much as they can, and in the shortest possible time, before they are surprised by the rulings of fate, hence you see them dividing their lives into two parts, one in public, and the other in secret, they preach everything that pleases the hearing, but behind the back of society they hoard and hoard, and as long as the moral standard has been dual between secret and public, it is inevitable that life will be dominated by hypocrisy, that creates the deep chasm that separate words and actions. This is about one of the two questions that the questioner asked in his letter, and as for the second question that asks about the reason why solutions to problems in developing countries are temporary, that is if they do not find themselves in a dead end that does not offer solutions, neither permanent nor temporary. While we note in developed countries are another form of approach that leads those countries to solve their problems in a way that ensures for their progress for them, the reason sir which has no other reason is in the method of thinking with which people approach solving their problems, whereas in developed countries, that method is the closest thing to the methods of scientific thinking, with all that that thinking requires of accuracy in statistics and precision in inferring results from the data. You find the method in developing countries is dominated by a mixture of knowledge and emotion and between honesty and lies. For example, in developing countries, it is not far-fetched for us to set a standard based on the student's ability to achieve, and then we will rush to purely emotional exceptions such as saying, the children of martyrs have the right to exceed the standard, and thus those who do not have the ability to study medicine will join the College of Medicine, for example. Indeed, a developing country may fall into more serious mistakes as a result of emotion, such as wishing for itself what it is not within its power. Wishing to be on par with rich and developed countries in some aspects of governance, in establishing projects that it has no interest in, or other things that scientific thinking would refuse to do. We relied on him. In short, the difference between developing countries and developed countries in dealing with their problems lies in adhering to the scientific method or neglecting it. Here I feel it necessary to add another factor, which is that the relationship between the ruler and the ruled in developing countries is not completely similar to that relationship in developed countries. Countries. While there the fear of the ruled from their ruler is almost non-existent, here we find the opposite, as that fear is almost the norm. The result of this is that whoever is asked to consider dealing with a specific problem will most likely present what he expects to be met with satisfaction from his boss, not what would be satisfied with impartial, abstract scientific thinking. How often have we seen our economic and non-economic policies turned upside down overnight, not because falsehood disappeared in one minute and was replaced by truth in one minute as well, but because an idea of the ruler was replaced by another idea. As long as we are talking about science and its method, this is an appropriate opportunity for me to address what was sent by Mr. FF. Asked about determinism and probability in scientific laws, His Excellency said, in your article Calculated Adventures when speaking about the deductive method and the experimental scientific method, you said this phrase, the one who adopts the new method is satisfied with what is likely correct and subject to correction. So there is no stability or rest in certain results. It is said that it is the truth that does not change with time, and does not change with time. Does the meaning of these phrases mean that the world in which we live has become devoid of deterministic phenomena, and everything in it has become relatively probabilistic? If you say, for example, that by combining oxygen and hydrogen in a certain proportion, water is inevitably formed, and if water vapor is exposed to a cold surface, it condenses and inevitably turns into water, and the rotation of the earth around itself in front of the sun inevitably leads to the alternation of day and night etc. So where is the possibility in such scientific phenomena? Realism? My answer to Mr. FF, it is that the concept of determinism, when it was attributed to the events of the world, and therefore it is attributed to the scientific laws that describe the behavior of those events, only implied that the previous event carries in its nature the subsequent event, such that it is a logical impossibility for the first to occur, and the second not to occur. 
Therefore, during the period that extended from the era of Newton until the era of Einstein, the supporters of determinism thought that it was enough for us to know a present fact in order to infer from it all the past and all the future with mathematical precision. Why? Because the present truth is the inevitable product of what has passed and the inevitable birth of what is to come. When we say that this idea of inevitability has given way to the idea of probability, we mean specifically that the subsequent event in the series of events came after the event that preceded it, but that does does not mean that it was included in it. Just as we notice the steady succession between the bell rings at school and the students enter the classroom. Even if the two cases differ in terms of the degree of uniformity, if it is well established in our minds that the laws of science monitor the sequence of events wherever they are observed consistently in that sequence, this will result in an important result, which is that the scientific law was built on what was seen and what experiments were conducted on. So it is like a story telling about what happened. Indeed, there is nothing in the story of the past that implies that it will happen in the future as well. If we assume that two events A and B have been observed in continuous succession or conjunction between them and a scientific law is formulated on this basis then the followers of scientific determinism in this case say, it is impossible for A to occur unless B occurs after it or with it, while supporters of scientific probability say, B is impossible for it to occur unless it is preceded or accompanied by A, but the opposite is not true in the sense that if A occurs, there is no guarantee that B will occur with it or after it, we take one of the examples mentioned by the questioner, which is that water is inevitably formed by the combination of oxygen and hydrogen, so we say, yes, if there is water, we say that those two elements must have combined, since the combination of oxygen and hydrogen is the same as water, as if we are not saying anything more, from our saying that the union of oxygen and hydrogen is the union of oxygen and hydrogen, but if we knew from the beginning that there are oxygen and hydrogen, then their presence does not necessitate that they combine to form water, as they may remain two elements independent of each other. And once again I say that determinism in the relationship between A and B means that the existence of A it is necessary that B be attached to it, and the existence of B necessitates that A preceded it. As for probability, it means that the existence of B necessitates that A also existed, and as for the existence of A, it does not necessitate that B be attached to it. As you may or may not catch up with it, if Mr. FF, all of his examples that he sent to me in his letter, and I will only mention some of them here, he found that they all depict sequences in the occurrence of events, which we observed in the form of laws, when we notice their steady occurrence. I would like to draw His Excellency's attention to the difference between two types that we usually associate with each other even though they are not equal, impossibility based on what we have experienced in our observations and experiments and impossibility, which is a logical impossibility. Let us take one of your examples, which is the one in which we say that the rotation of the earth around itself inevitably leads to the alternation of day and night. It is as if you are saying by this that it is impossible for the earth to rotate, even if the earth stops rotating, as you said in an objectionable sentence, without the alternation of night and day, and this as you can see is an impossibility based on what we have seen so far, but what would happen to the alternation of night and day? If God Almighty wanted one day to obliterate the eye of the sun, the impossibility that you imagined, sir, is an experimental impossibility, not a logical impossibility. Otherwise, compare that to our saying. It is impossible for the number 2 not to come before the number 3 in the series of natural numbers, and that it is impossible for a triangle on a flat surface to have its angles come. Two right angles are not equal. Thus, you find that the logical impossibility only occurs in what they call analytical sentences, that is, sentences that repeat their first half in their second half, with symbols different from their symbols in the first half. As I mentioned above, I mention one aspect of the many aspects that let us to say that probability in science has today replaced determinism. It is sufficient for me here to point to two other examples from two different fields to illustrate other aspects of the idea of probability in science. The first is the laws specific to the atom from the inside, that is, the laws that regulate for us the movement of electrons in its orbits. Here we find ourselves faced with a movement that occurs on foundations that are not the foundations. In the law of gravitation as Newton left it, and Mr. FF gave this law of gravitation as an example, and and take another example from another field, which is the mixing of hot and cold gases or liquids, so I think you know that what science deduces in cases like these are statistical averages of velocities different atoms, and if we say statistical averages, 
it is as if we set a probability result, and this is the same thing you say about any scientific law that we base on measures of speed, length, weight, or anything that is measured. Here, too, science has no choice but to take statistical averages for the different numbers that we see on the micrometers. Whenever we repeat the standard process for speed or anything else, we find a slightly different number. So the scientific researcher resorts to extracting the averages of the different numbers for one specific phenomenon, and this makes the result probable, as you can see. Because every progress we make in measuring devices will give us other numbers that are more accurate than the numbers we obtain with the old devices. You mentioned something like this in your letter. And to Mr. FF addressing the letter, I say, I hesitated to answer your letter because I knew that it would involve us in details that would not be easy to present to readers, and since I chose in the end to give this brief answer, I must express my reproach to the author of the letter for his haste in jumping from a discussion that revolves around a purely scientific point that touches on the foundations of the scientific method, to enter into topics that relate to religion in some and pertain to politics in others. So listen to your statement in which you said, The mind wants from certainty that the existence of the true God is proven, which is not addressed by any iota of possibility or doubt. Is there any doubt about God? As the noble verse says, I do not rule out that the scholars of the doctrine of probability in science are communists who want to say to the whole world in the end, under the guise of science, that God's existence is possible and his non-existence is possible. Mr. FF I would have expected from a man who wrote a speech of the same level as yours from a scientific standpoint, not to confuse him, as those below him do, to degrees that confuse different meanings with such a strange confusion. However, you should know, my brother, that if the events of the universe take place according to scientific determinism, then they take place thus by the will of their creator. Glory be to him, and if these events take place based on scientific probability, then they are also like this by the will of their creator. Glory be to him, and I say scientific determinism and scientific probability. Because determinism and possibility here are limited to what human science is capable of, but God's knowledge of what he has created is something else, and communism and non-communism have nothing to do with the subject unless it is written for us to appeal to the general public, even if the subject is one of the most specific characteristics of science and its methods. Dot. I think it is forbidden for us to intentionally descend on our own without any reason that requires us to descend. 